Welcome to part two of our Biology of Marine Life lecture on oceanography. We mentioned what we see above uh, last class with the surface currents. You can see the loop current and the uh, currents in the Gulf uh, in this image. You can also see uh, where the Florida platform is extended uh, out, and that would now be the continental shelf. The drop off would be the continental slope, and then the abyssal floor would be deep. So you can see these characteristics in this image. We're going to start off with saltwater chemistry. Very important in marine biology because life needs to regulate its salt balance. We will see many uh, ways that marine life gets rid of salt, uh, like mangroves can get rid of salt by shedding old, le old leaves called sacrificial leaves, or having adaptations to exclude salt in the roots, or even get rid of it through their leaves. So that's regulating salt balance. Any organism that lives in salt water has to deal with salinity. So and one more example before I move on, our sea turtles are always excreting salt through their eyes. So when they climb ashore to lay eggs, their eyes look like they're crying, and those are called turtle tears. Uh, of course, they're really not crying, they're getting rid of salt. And in the ocean, when they're swimming, that would wash away. So salt is very important in the marine environment. Water is H2O, and we're not going to get into too much chemistry, but I'd like you to look at the image. Uh, hydrogen is very small, one nucleus with a plus one, and one electron with a minus one. Now oxygen has a nucleus of plus eight, which is a lot stronger than plus one, so it holds the electrons that are shared in a covalent bond, electrons are shared. It holds those electrons tighter and takes on a partially negative charge. Because of that, hydrogen gets a partially positive charge and water is what we call a polar molecule. One end, the hydrogen end, being partially positive. One end, the oxygen end, being partially negative. This polar bond leads water to attract itself because opposite charges attract. That's called hydrogen bonding. Uh, it also allows water to dissolve things. That's why water is the universal solvent. It allows things to get wet that have charges on them. Uh, so it gives water a lot of unique properties. So this polar molecule is the reason why water is really the basis of life on our planet. And that principle is displayed here. You can see the positive hydrogen poles. Hydrogen are the small gray atoms. They're smaller than oxygen. And the negative oxygen pole actually attract each other. So this gives water very unique properties and it's called hydrogen bonding. It's not a true chemical bond. It's an attraction between polar molecules. Because water has polar hydrogen bonding, it forms crystals when it freezes, making ice less dense because of those air pockets you can see in the illustration. So ice floats on water, allowing living things to thrive even in frozen conditions because only the top of the water freezes and deep water will stay liquid. So Things can survive winters because, or live in the Arctic and Antarctic because of this unique property of the solid being less dense than the liquid. Energy is measured in a unit called calories. When you burn one gram of something and it raises the temperature of water one degree Celsius, that's called a calorie. The capital C is a kilocalorie or a thousand calories. So our food's measured in calories. Just for instance, let's say you had uh, something that was 120 calories. Well, if you were to burn that, it would give off enough energy 
to make 120 grams of water raise one degree Celsius. And that's how calories literally are measured with foods and other things. Now your body through respiration technically burns, and I'm using air quotes, burns your food giving off energy. So that's how calories relate to food. In water, the energy uh, units calories would be coming from the sun. So water has a very high heat capacity. It takes a lot of energy to switch its temperature. So areas near water tend to be cooler in the summer and warmer in the winter because they have a high heat capacity. I want you to look at that table to the right and look at granite and sand because that's what beaches and land is mostly made out of. 0.2 is their heat capacity. So really it takes 0.2 calories to change one gram of land a degree Celsius, 0.2. It takes a full calorie to change water a degree Celsius. So water heats up a lot slower, cools down a lot slower, and moderates world climate. That is important, and that's why water is a relatively stable environment. The effects of this can be shown right on the sea with the our here in Florida, we get those afternoon thunderstorms. Now I have a look at that top picture. The land warms up a lot faster than the water, causing the warm air to rise, pulling the moist water off of the Gulf all day. And then around three o'clock or four o'clock when the temperatures sufficiently dropped and the lower image starts to happen, all that water that's built up in the atmosphere rains. And that's why we have coastal storms all the time. Uh, it doesn't happen every location every day, but somewhere in our area, every afternoon, that water is returning to earth with afternoon thunderstorms. So during the day, you're getting a constant breeze off of the ocean because of water's heat capacity. And during the evening, you're getting a constant breeze towards the ocean because of water's heat capacity. Water is a solution, which means the solute, which is in the case of water, we have gases like dissolved nitrogen and oxygen or salts like sodium chloride and potassium and carbonates, calcium carbonates, dissolved in a solvent which is generally a liquid, usually water. So a solution is an even mixture, homogeneous, even mixture of dissolved solids in water. So water is a salt water solution. Now salt, what we use on food is one type of salt, that's table salt, but it's not the only type of salt there is. Calcium chloride is a salt, potassium chloride. We have um, carbonate salts, calcium carbonate. So salts form ions and dissolve in water. Gases dissolve in water as well. That's how fish get oxygen. They don't breathe like we do. They use gills and pulls dissolved oxygen from the water. So polar solvents generally are something dissolved in water. You saw what a polar molecule is. So the liquid is polar, the salt dissolves. A nonpolar solvent would be something like turpentine, nail polish remover. It dissolves nonpolar substances. Fats, oils, and waxes are nonpolar they would break down in a nonpolar solvent, but they will not break down to an extent in a polar solvent. So something that dissolves in water is polar is called hydrophilic. Something that doesn't dissolve in water is called hydrophobic. And those terms will come up when we talk about cell biology later on in this class. 
So in this case near a marina, this picture could be typically seen. The gasoline is nonpolar, okay? It's a hydrocarbon, nonpolar, and it is less dense than water, so it is sitting on top of the water, not dissolving into it. Uh, so nonpolar molecules do not dissolve in water very well. So what is seawater made of? You know, there's greater than 70 elements, but really only six of them make up the bulk of our dissolved solids. Uh, chlor chloride's the first, sodium, and then you have sulfate, which is a complex molecule called a polyatomic ion, magnesium, potassium, calcium. These are the major constituents of dissolved salt. The solubility is how much of something dissolves in water. Now the ocean salinity is 3.5% or 35 parts per thousand. Oxygen, which is really needed, dissolves in water, very low quantities, but in cooler water, more oxygen dissolves than warmer water. So that is an example of pressure and temperature, sorry, temperature um, determining how much dissolves, its solubility. Pressure, gases dissolve better in pressure. So the deeper you go, the more dissolved gases. Uh, so pressure and temperature have a lot to do with what's dissolved, where it's dissolved, and how much is dissolved. Again, I mentioned the salinity, the total amount of solids dissolved in water is 3.5 percent or 35 parts per thousand. Make note of the symbol of parts per thousand. It's like a percent but there's an extra zero. So 35 parts per thousand is equal to 3.5 percent. Now brackish water is anywhere between five parts per thousand or 0.5% and salt water 3.5. So that's brackish water, a mixture of salt and fresh water. On the field trip that we take to um, the estuary wall spring, the headwaters are basically fresh water pouring out of that aquifer. But then once it enters the stream, it's brackish and the salinity gets greater and greater the closer you get to Boggy Bayou, which is a very salty brackish estuary, and it gets saltier and saltier until you get to the Gulf. So salinity changes in the same body of water uh, depending on where you are. So this global map of salinity shows you the saltiest areas, the saltiest areas uh, are right along the equator. And that's because of, or sorry, the saltiest areas are in the middle of the ocean basins. The fresher, uh, less salinity are right on the equator. And it's a little less saline on the equator because of the rainfall. We've heard of tropical rainforests and you get a lot of rainfall along the equator. Now, uh, the area in the ocean basins get less rainfall, higher degree of evaporation right along those tropic lines, and they have the saltier. So rainfall and evaporation patterns determine ocean salinity. Water flows into and out of cells based on salinity. We call that tonicity. Isotonic, uh, was the same salinity as fresh water and your living thing. Uh, echinoderms like starfish, they use seawater as their blood, so they're isotonic. Their blood is the same salinity as the surrounding water. Marine mammals, marine reptiles, they have hypertonic bodies, so they have to get rid of salt, okay? The turtle tears are getting rid of salt. They urinate very concentrated urine to
to get rid of salt. So organisms that um, are uh, getting rid of salt, they're called hypertonic. Hypotonic could occur, let's say you're, you're in an estuary and the shark, the shark, the bull shark, which breeds in estuaries, leaves salt water and enters a less saline estuary. Another example would be a salmon leaving the ocean and entering uh, fresh water to lay its eggs. Well, they have a saltier body than uh, the surrounding water, and we call that hypotonic. Hypo means less, hyper means more, iso means the same. That's what those prefixes are. Dissolved gases are very important. At depth, at depth, more gas is dissolved because of the pressure. Think of a can of soda. It's under pressure. When you release that pressure, whoosh, carbonation occurs. Now think of a scuba diver at depth. They have more gases dissolved in their blood. If they come up too fast, whoosh, those gases turn to air bubbles because it can't hold as much. That's what the vents are. So uh, at depth, organisms have greater concentrations of dissolved gases. Nitrogen is the major gas because nitrogen is the major gas in the atmosphere. Scuba divers, when they get too much nitrogen in their blood at depth, get what we call nitrogen narcosis. They can feel high and uh, lose their, um, they get vertigo. Oxygen, which we really need for respiration, dissolves more readily in cold water. That's why productivity near the poles is greater than productivity near the equator, believe it or not. And there is an oxygen minimum zone that occurs from the depths about 200 to 1,000 uh, meters where there's less life. Now, the deep ocean has plenty of oxygen for the life there. The surface gets oxygen from photosynthesis, but there is a layer that is oxygen depleted, and we call that the oxygen minimum zone. This image shows you where dissolved gases are the most abundant, and you can see red is the most abundant. Cooler water holds more oxygen. pH. pH is the con measures the concentration of hydrogen ions. Hydrogen ions are acidic. Now, neutral pH has one hydrogen ion and one OH minus ion for H2O. Something's basic, it has OH minus ions. Something's acidic, it has H plus ions. Seven is neutral. So anything higher than seven is basic, has more OH minus. Anything lower than seven is acidic, has more H plus. The seawater is mildly basic, mildly basic. Surface 8.3, depth 7.8, but we're looking at a slightly basic solution. That's what uh, pH is. Now, we've all heard of acid rain and the oceans are starting to acidify, get more acidic. Organisms will have to adapt or die, but dissolved carbonate, calcium carbonate, is a buffer. That's what Tums, Tums, calcium carbonate. It neutralizes acids. So as the oceans pick up pH, the calcium carbonate buffers it, but now there's not as much calcium carbonate for organism shells, and it starts to hurt the food chain. This is the pH scale. You can see pure water is pH 7, seawater is pH 8. You can see hydrochloric acid and battery acid have low pHs. You can see common substances like vinegar, low pH. Coffee, low pH. So this is the pH scale. Carbonic acid from carbon dioxide 
When carbon dioxide mixes with water, carbonic acid forms, H2CO3. That's H2O plus CO2 gives you carbonic acid. And that carbonic acid swings the pH. Uh, in, in lakes, in lakes, uh, pH is dropped measurably in many northern lakes, uh, causing organisms to die and lakes to die out. The ocean has a great deal of that buffer in it, so the ocean's pHs have remained remarkably stable despite all of the carbon dioxide we've been releasing into the atmosphere. But we're closing in on a tipping point where we're starting to see the effects in certain calcium carbonate-based plankton. That buffer protects against pH change, and calcium carbonate is a buffer in our blood, keeps our body stable, and it's a buffer in the ocean, keeping the ocean stable. As you go deeper, water pressure increases. So uh, the deeper you go, the greater the pressure. Every 33 feet or about 10 meters, you increase the pressure by one entire atmosphere. So at sea level, you have a pressure of one atmosphere. You go down 33 feet, you have a pressure of two atmospheres. And that's not a lot when you think about the ocean is kilometers deep. Uh, so you go fishing out of Hubbard's Marina. You catch a fish in the depth of 38 feet, 40 feet. You reel it up fast. And then you notice sometimes that it's gas bladder sticking out of its mouth. Well, that's because you changed its pressure so quick, you reduced the pressure in half, and its internal pressure pushed that gas bladder right out of its mouth. So organisms are adapted for various pressures. The largest sea turtle in the world is the loggerhead turtle, and it does not have a hard shell. It has a flexible shell. And this shell can compress when it dives a thousand feet deep to eat. So water pressure is very important with dissolving and for organisms. The ocean now has different layers. The surface layer is warm because of the sun. You can see this image here. Uh, in the summer, the north would have a little greater surface. In the winter, the south would have a little greater surface. But this is sunlit water. The intermediate water is that oxygen minimum zone. Okay, it's a transition. It's intermediate. And then the deep water is made up of North Atlantic and Antarctic water. That's the most dense. So the ocean is literally layered. And these layers don't mix very well because they're slightly different densities. The surface, where most life occurs because of photosynthesis, is warm. It doesn't have many nutrients. Why? They're used. And uh, it's well oxygenated due to photosynthesis. Uh, the intermediate water, oxygen minimum, not as much life. The deeper water, increased nutrients, increased dissolved gases. They're separated by density, okay? Uh, cold tends to be more dense because of contraction. Warm tends to be less dense because of expansion. And that's why warm water rises, cool water sinks. Water's unique though, because we mentioned the solid is less dense. So water's maximum density is just about four degrees Celsius. So all that deep water is in the neighborhood of four degrees Celsius. 80% of the ocean, four degrees Celsius. Cold, dark, and salty. That's the ocean. The surface zone is the smallest warm sunlit layer. 95% of the life lives there, only 2% of the ocean. That middle area, that intermediate water, is called a pycnocline. Pycno means density, cline means change density change. It's also a thermocline, temperature change. It's also a halocline, salinity change. Oxygen minimum, 18% of ocean. Then the deep area, 
all around four degrees Celsius, all dark, and that takes up about 80% of the ocean. It's supplied from the North Atlantic and the Antarctic. So there's an image of the uh, layers separated. The also shows you the approximate depth of each. So you have your surface, your pycnocline, and your deep layer. The thermocline is the rapid temperature drop in the pycnocline. Pycno means density. So you have a rapid temperature change for that uh, layer. That's called the thermocline. Sunlight now is only present in the surface of the ocean, warms it up, allows photosynthesis by phytoplankton, by algae, and of course, most animals live there and they can navigate. Light is what, well, light we call attenuation as it's uh, filtered out by the water until eventually you get too deep for any light at all. The surface layer is called the photic zone. And then as your light gets dimmer and dimmer, eventually there's not enough light for photosynthesis. That's called the dysphotic zone. And then eventually there's no light at all. It's totally dark. And that's called the aphotic zone. You can see in this image, blue light penetrates the deepest. And what color does the ocean appear? Blue, not a coincidence. Red light is filtered out first. So you have three zones in the ocean, the euphotic or just plain photic, the dysphotic where there's enough light for vision, but not enough light for photosynthesis. And then the aphotic zone, by the way, 80% of the organisms that live in the aphotic zone make their own light by bioluminescence. So in the surface zone, you have most productivity, all photosynthesis, because you have to have light. In the deep ocean, you get chemosynthesis, so there is productivity. In that middle layer, you don't get much. That transition zone, then, is oxygen minimum. We can study it using submersible. You do have life moving in between the zones. Generally speaking, look at the largest eyes, the giant squid, or no eyes, the um, jellyfish. But all of them in that have that move have flexible bodies. We call an organism like these guys, they have hydrostatic bodies that water determines their rigidity, not bones. In the deep, most organisms glow using bioluminescence to communicate and to attract prey and to flee from prey, confusing uh, predators. So the anglerfish, there it is with a bioluminescent, bioluminescent organ, attracting organisms to those jagged teeth. Hydrostatic hydrostatic skeleton this guy is a rigid fish at depth because the pressure holds them together you bring them up blob that is the blob fish they can only live in pressure now when you look at the ocean floor i mentioned these when we looked at the opening image the continental shelf average is 50 miles about but it goes much further than 50 miles on the west coast of Florida. That's the rise and fall of sea level due to glaciers and interglaciers. Uh, we're in an interglacial period right now. We have ice caps, but they're small. So sea level is high, which means much of our continents, about 11%, are underwater. So we have big continental shelves, large areas that are shallow, sunlight reaches the bottom, and 
very productive. The continental slope is that steep, the steep drop off to the abyss. The abyss is the deep ocean floor. Now you can see that continental rise, that's where sediments build up. So there's sediments from the continent sitting on the abyssal floor. And then you have these uh, mid-ocean ridges with deep sea uh, volcanoes in the middle. Average depth of the ocean, over 12,000 feet. So basically, you can classify oceans as continental margins, which would be the continental shelf and the continental slope, and then the abyss, the deep ocean floor, and those mid-ocean ridges. You see the term granitic rocks? Continents are made of granite. See the term basaltic rocks? Ocean basins are made of basalt. That's geologic. Uh, you'll learn a lot about that in, in hardcore oceanography. So the continental margin is the shelf and the slopes. You have a shelf break where continents end, and then you have accumulated sediments past the shelf break sitting on the abyssal floor, continental rise. This image shows you the topography the East Coast. You can see Long Island, you can see New Jersey, you can see Massachusetts, you can see the broad continental shelf, the steep drop off, and then the rise sitting on the ocean floor. You also see old riverbeds that are now underwater. That's the Hudson River Canyon. So Hudson River Canyon extends through the continental shelf. Now on the deep ocean basins, you have ocean ridges with hydrothermal vents. Those hydrothermal vents spew out chemicals used for chemosynthesis. You have abyssal hills and plains, which are called seamounts and guilts, and then trenches and island arcs. So a hydrothermal vent is also called a black smoker because it spews out hydrogen sulfite, which is a black chemical that is used in chemosynthesis, the hydrogen sulfide is used for energy production, so entire deep sea organisms and deep sea ecosystems thrive around these vents. Seamounts are just extinct underwater volcanoes, and as they erode, they become guyouts because guyouts have flat tops. They're very ecologically important because they can reach up to the photic zone. So in areas where you wouldn't have life because it's too dark and too deep, you actually have life because parts of it reach up. So these seamounts and guyouts are ecological hotspots in deep ocean areas. A uh, little terminology, the littoral zone is the zone between the tides. You see that picture. Neuritic zone is the zone over the continental shelf. The oceanic or pelagic zone is the area over the abyss. You can see the shelf, the bathial zone. Bathial is, means uh, slope. Abyssal means the deep sea floor. And the hadal means deep sea trench. You also have the euphotic dysphotic and aphotic zones shown in this image. So this image is a lot of terminology and terminology gets thrown around a lot in lectures, uh, but now you know what each of these vocabulary words means if you run across them. So our littoral zone is intertidal. We study a lot of this in our class because, you know, we're pretty much tied to the shore, littoral zone. The neuritic zone is the area where sunlight reaches the bottom over the continental shelf. Very, very productive, biologically productive. We're talking 90% of ocean life can be found in the littoral neuritic area. The oceanic zone or pelagic is the blue water that's over the depth. Now, there's the biggest fish in the sea, the whale shark. They are floating reefs. Look at all the 
life it sustains. Uh, it eats plankton, and then all those organisms swim around with it. And algae can grow near it and on it. Uh, so they are like floating communities, these huge whale sharks. The bathyal zone is over the slope. This terminology, bathyal you may hear, you're not going to look at mesopelagic, epipelagic, bathopelagic. So just worry about bathyal zone. And the abyss, the deep. The hadal zone is over deep sea trenches. That's the deepest points in the ocean. Uh, some of them can be six kilometers deep. This picture I took scuba diving. Look at that. That guy's an ambush predator under the sand. Stingray. Marine lifestyles. A lot of times in a chart, you'll see natural history of the organism. Uh, well, it's lifestyle. How it gets food and what it does. So these are the lifestyles of organisms in the ocean. Plankton. Plankton is the drifters. They drift on currents. It comes from the term planktos, Greek, for wanderer. Phytoplankton would be a photosynthetic lifestyle of a plankton. These are photosynthetic algae mostly. Now floating propagules for mangroves would be a phytoplankton as it's floating. A zooplankton would be protists, animals that eat. A holoplankton spends all of its life as a plankton. A meroplankton is merely a larva that changes into something else as an adult. So red tide, red tide, the image above, is caused by the photoplankton. The phytoplankton is dinoflagellate. And then below that, you have a crab larva, and that would be a meroplankton. It would grow into a benthic crab. Speaking of benthic, benthic means living on the bottom. You can be living attached to the seafloor, like an epifauna. You can crawl around. You can bury into the sand in fauna. But benthic. Now, most adult organisms are benthic. But almost every organism goes through a planktonic stage when they're little. Nectin. Nectin are the swimming organisms. They're the rarest because, well, you got to be big. Cephalopods, like squid and octopi, large fish, and marine reptiles. Now, the last couple of slides had some artwork done by one of my students many years ago. Her name was Carrie. She was a fine student, and she did that as part of her project, uh, her field guide project, which, you know, I thought that was brilliant. She gave me permission to use a few. Well, that wraps up our second lecture on oceanography. Thank you for joining us. I hope that you have a great day.